Afternoon, Chris. How are you doing? All good, thanks. How about yourself? I'm very well. Uh, firstly, thank you for agreeing to come on and do um, a bit of an interview, a bit of business spotlight with your company, um, Body. I think it's some, I've had a bit of a chat with you before. It's absolutely incredible, like what's going on in the background um, and also the visions you've got for the business. So I can't wait to get into the questions. So um, just to give a bit of context around the interview, if you could just first give us a quick, a quick overview of what Body is and uh, yeah, who it's meant for and how it works. Yeah, so um, Body is a wearable enabled health tech solution that allows physiotherapy patients to stay engaged during their recovery process. So we've developed a solution that allows an individual um, who's particularly recovering from um, physical injury, so it might be a joint-related problem, um, to actually map their range of movement easily using um, our sensor and a mobile app. Yeah. When you said that about stay engaged, um, it made me think of a stat that apparently more people, um, less people take their own medicine than give their dog medicine. So if the dog's ill, they'll give the medicine like every day without fail, like more than yeah. that to the minute. Whereas if they're ill, they just won't take the, you know, they'll do it for a couple of days or doing, ah, uh, you know, I'll carry on. So is that something that you found um, as like a gap in the market that people are going to the physio, but then they're not necessarily doing the work? Yeah, that, that's precisely it. So, um, you know, I, I knew that there was a problem in the space that people weren't having amazing recovery journeys um, and can come to my story uh, a bit later on. But it's um, when, when access to quality, consistent care is so high, um, people are really reliant on just self-managing. So you might go into a clinic, be it public or private, and they kind of get you to go away and self-manage yourself and that, that that's really important and people should take control of their own health um, and they should be motivated to do it however um, in reality people go away and then they put put away the leaflet or the sheath um, or they say they're doing the exercises they'll come back for their follow-up um, and be like yeah I did it um, and, and I'm not feeling great anymore and like in reality no one has um, there's actually data which shows um what that level is and 70% of people actually don't follow on with their plan. So, yeah. so there's a huge gap there. And then, and I guess when you think about like the actual um, levels of waiting lists, follow up rates in, in healthcare and what the stress is and how there's a huge, um, uh, there's not enough supply of physiotherapists and people actually can solve these problems by just being a bit more engaged, being a bit more fine-tuned, educated in their health. There's a huge opportunity um, and we're, we're trying to solve that. Awesome. Um, so tell us a bit more about your journey then. So, uh, and your story, like how did you, it's quite, it's a really niche, you know, niche thing for you to think about um, yeah, getting into. So, so tell us a bit yeah, more. Yeah, I, I, I guess it's... Um, it's a lot of passion into it. So I started body after a lot of poor experiences. So I was um, like many people, an aspiring footballer. I was playing at a fairly decent level, committed, and the dream was always to play football. Um, and then when I was 17, tore my ACL um, in my knee. So it's like quite a big knee injury. Sometimes requires operations, sometimes it doesn't different physios will, will argue and different surgeons will argue um, but it does have a huge impact because if you don't get your recovery right what tends to happen is that you'll typically have follow-on injuries or if, if you're not very well taken care of and you don't have a long-term outlook on how you're preparing how you're recovering to sport or just getting back to daily life um, it has a long-term uh, issue and you most people might have re-injury, re-tear. So I ultimately tore my ligaments three times, had like hamstring problems, a bunch of, a bunch of crazy issues. Um, and that was because I just didn't have the right level of care. Now moving around didn't help. So I moved countries, uh, but then there were so many barriers to actual good quality health. Um, and so I wanted to solve that problem. And I kind of started to tamper with the idea um, about the back end of COVID um, and then just worked at it. Our initial approach to solving this problem was way different. So that we, like the business has evolved incredibly. We actually wanted to develop a pain management device um, and it's just 
stemmed funding, a lot of customer discovery, a lot of speaking to the right people in the ecosystem. And today we're kind of in a really strong position solving a very niche problem. And I think that really helps create um, opportunities rather than trying to do everything at once and solve all the problems um, at the beginning, which um, will be wasting a lot of money without actually having the right data to back yourself up. Incredible. So you've been going a few years. Um, how, has the, how has the journey been over the past couple of years? Yeah, so we were back in April, we were still in idea stage. Um, so we raised a, a round of funding when we were still in idea, which was fairly lucky um, and we really only started development about last June, July and that's when we started prototyping um, and then started developing an app towards the end of, end of the year, an MVP app. Um, now, because I'm non-technical, um, I had to rely on other partners and so it's like a bit of a weird dynamic um, as many other non-technical founders will find. So it's kind of a learning process for you as a founder, especially when you're first time in the tech world trying to build something venture scalable. Um, so that's, that's really difficult and I think over the past year and a half, it's been a learning curve of how do you build the right tech leanly without actually wasting too much money, um, but also ensuring that you're actually building the right commercial avenues. That's that's a bit of a challenge as well. Um, and just balancing those um, has been ha has been a real learning curve. Um, I actually worked on the business part time between when I started and up until July. So I had a couple of other roles within tech and within ventures, which was great because I actually learned much more from it. But then quit my role in July and went full time into the business. And since that's happened, we've just accelerated um, a lot of the development and commercial partnerships um, and we're now fundraising as well. Amazing. So if you could go back um, all over to the beginning, what would you have done differently? Yeah. It's easy to look back at things in hindsight. Um, I think the... think, of it, think of the answer is if somebody else was in your shoes a year ago, what advice would you give them now that you didn't know then? Um, I think find a way to be in the business full time as quickly as possible. Um, you know, when you're completely focused and you don't have any other things that you have to cross over with, it kind of allows you to really accelerate and put all your mind and thought into actually solving the problem. Um, I think another thing is don't overlook speaking to people. Like I put off actually talking to patients and physios for much longer um, than than. I should have. And I think when you do that much earlier on, even before I actually did it after we raised investment, and I wish we did before, because I think we could have actually built a better um, opportunity for ourselves um, when we think of valuations, money, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if we actually did that before raising investment, because you kind of cultivate a much better um message you cultivate a much better idea proposition you'll actually understand what problem you're solving way more after you speak to about 100 people um, about what you're doing so i guess that would be the, the big thing um, i also think you don't need to raise too much money uh, to begin with if you can find a way to build an mvp really cheaply um, in a few months and allow yourself to sustain living. Um, you don't necessarily have to jump to raising money from venture investors because that brings a whole lot of other problems and it kind of makes you lose focus from actually solving the problem and being engaged. Cool. Um, so in terms of being an employer then, is that is that is this your first business you've been involved in or have you been in have you run other businesses before? Now, um, first tech business. Um, so I've not uh, first time founder. My is, uh, we've uh, done a few other projects in the past, which have been really fun with friends. Uh, this has been a huge learning curve. Um, we don't have any full time employees, but we work with a number of cons 
consulting 17 members sporadically that allows us to actually keep a low burning rate and extend one, which is pretty important um, at this stage, of, at least when we're really high risk. Um, so it's been, you know, it's been a learning to figure out who we want to work with um, and not try to be phased by um, some of their past experiences or what they can promise um, that may be a deliver over delivery. So I think for me, the biggest thing is just figure out whether you trust the person, whether they're passionate about the business. And if they are, I think everything else kind of falls into place. Um, and that's the people that we're working with, uh, we get Mark, um, Jack, who's, who's just come on board. They're all people who I believe in the problem we're solving. Um, they've got really good experience behind them. Um, but are just passionate. And they want to work with me. They want to work with somebody. That's exactly the, the most important thing for me. When choosing yeah. people to work with. And how did you, how have you managed to grasp whether people are passionate about it or not? Like, what are the things that you look for? Um, I think it's really down to without, you can work with someone without them being an employee. And work with them without having to pay them and if they're willing to work with you if they've shared ideas they've taken a, a proactive approach to trying to help the business um i think that's a very quick way so if you're like already helping to make introductions to sh talking about the business as if there's their own um th that means you're important to the vision the shared the shared common goal yeah, so it's like, like get to win. Yeah. It, it's like if you and I were having this conversation and you would say, oh, we could do this, or oh, this is what the aspiration is, maybe we should talk to these people. Um, I think it comes to gut as well, a lot of the time. Um, you know, you can tell by meeting someone if you like them or not. And um, I had co-founders in the business before, and ultimately it didn't work out. That was before we raised investment, and they were great people. Um really intelligent um but at the same time you couldn't you kind of have that gut feeling that maybe in the long term this might not work out um and ultimately that's okay um and i think you 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 figure that out early and that that's that's a good thing about not having full-time employees yet is because um you don't have to be tied into actually having people who aren't passionate or want to see the business through. You know, when we're at such an early stage of the business, um, it requires a lot of hours, a lot of thought, and it's not exactly like working a full-time job in a corporate environment. However, someone might think about work-life balance. It's like, it's more difficult than than, than something that's a bit more nine to five-ish. So you need someone who's a bit more committed and is willing to just answer answer you with message them at midnight and, and whatnot. Um, I'm sure any future employees would hate to have heard that. How do you how do you balance that then? So there's loads of people out there that you know you need to work 16, 18, 20 hours a day. Obviously, as a founder, you you know you've got a lot. So how do you manage your time? How do you, uh, and also balance personal life as well? Yeah, it's, it's balancing time is the hardest thing, I guess, for me. Um, I, I, I like to, I have things that I, I do that makes me happy. I mean, I play football still. So I play for a local football team. So twice a week, meet up with friends, training, get excited for the weekend, go down. It's like these things may, may make me happy. I spend a lot of time with my partner, which helps. Um, and, you know, having a partner who, who kind of backs what you do and is not worried about a little time she might be spending with you helps as well because it, it's not something you have to worry about. Um, but I'm comfortable spending longer hours on the business because I'm passionate about it, focused. Um, I can see where we're going. I get motivation from family, friends. Um, so it doesn't bother me as much. Um, but I do take time on my own. I, I'm full up. I, I don't wake up early. I, I'm pretty lazy in the morning. I wake up pretty late. Um, and when I say late, it's about 8.39. Um, but that's just because I'm inefficient in the morning. So there's no point in me being open. I typically stay up later. Um and, and, and get, get work done. But I think there's 
there's no real balance you can have at the early stages that we are at now. It's just be focused and have gaps and do nice things with fun people that will take your mind away. I had lunch with a friend this afternoon um, and it was great because I could step away from the business and then back on when I, when I come back. So, yeah. How have you found, so when I speak to a lot of business owners, certainly the younger ones, um, there's like there's sometimes a bit of a challenge in terms of maybe the friendship groups that when they started off with, they might have jobs, you as a founder or business owner, and then you go into this world and it's totally new and you, you know, so how have you found, have you found it easy to, you know, meet other peers and other people that are on the same journey as you to help, you know, to discuss these, because it's quite of a really unique thing that there's not many people know what it's like to go through this. What yeah. Uh, so, so it's funny because uh, um, it's a challenge, right? You have to say no a lot of the times to going out and going for, for, for drinks on the weekend, for example. Um, but I'm completely fine with it. You know, love my friends and, uh, you know, when you're talking about it, they, they see the passion and they support you as well, um, regardless if they care or not about physiotherapy and, and the problem they're solving. Um, so that helps. But um, personally, I've joined the founder groups. Um, so I'm part of this founder funding group. So it's a group of like 10 founders um, who are fundraising and they know the struggle that every of every one of us is facing fundraising. Um, so I'm part of a non-technical founders group as well. Um, and, you know, you don't spend time texting people all the time, but every now and then you see some of the struggles someone's facing and it's exactly the same thing you're facing. And that keeps you going because, you know, yeah. you're not, not, not on your own. Really interesting. Um, what's been the most influential book you've ever read, Chris? Um, I really enjoyed Zero to One, Peter Thiel. Uh, but right now I'm in the middle of Build, which is by um, Tony Fidel, I think his, his name is. Um, and I'd say that's probably one of the best books I read, um, mostly because it's very um, in line with what we're doing right now, uh, because he worked on a lot of hardware, software businesses that had a bit of crossover, uh, hardware enabled businesses. So it kind of allowed me to kind of think about my frame of mind um, and how do we approach problems. And it's, it's really good because it, it, it describes ways in which um, consumers perceive products. Um, and, and there's this really funny bit where he talks about the, the Google Nest um, and how the how people loved the screwdriver that came in the box, even though that wasn't even the product, uh, but that was a form of marketing uh, because most people didn't have that small screwdriver. Yeah. Um, but it was just, uh, it, it kind of opened my eyes into thinking about how we create um, great user experiences along the whole journey from the time when someone like goes to your site, but also like during the time when they're waiting for product to arrive, during the time when they receive product and then maybe follow up, like how do you kind of um, take take it all from one journey and make it into many journeys? Um, I, where, where you, we're actually working on how you can approach that now in business. Um, because I think it's uh, critical to make sure that someone has a great experience at like all of those points rather than just, yep, they subscribe to our hardware or they've purchased a device and now they're just on their own. Um, I think if you get all those little bits right, uh, it just makes it a much better overall experience. So that book's had huge influence on how I'm trying to approach problems. Have you found that your readings changed over over your journey, like as you, oh shit, I've got this problem, and I need to think about you know this, or and the more people you're speaking to, ha, ha, yeah. I find what's changing. You the type of reading that you are doing, so the books that you're reading. Yeah, is I'm reading like, less. <laughs> okay. Uh, less time. Um, so maybe a bit, few more podcasts. Um, because I can do that on the go. Um, I think I've always been interested in startup fundraising related books. Um, I think 
it is way more fine tuned to like where I'm at in the journey and I'm looking for little snippets that can help me. Um, and maybe if you looked at my podcast, Listen History, you'd probably see that because I'm watching things about fundraising, watching things about wearables and how the future of health is changing. Um, and I think it's important um, to stay up to date um, as a founder so that you know what other tech companies are doing, you know how investors are viewing wearables and health tech. Um, sometimes books don't give you that uh, too often. And sometimes books can make uh, very simple things a bit long winded. So you might spend a hundred pages reading something that could have taken a page for you to actually understand. Um, so um, less reading, but more podcasts, just because it's easier. You know. So where do you see yourself in five years' time? What's the what's the five year vision or ten year vision? What what's the vision for the company? Where where are you trying to get to with all this? I don't know. I don't know. It's just thing for I don't I don't know if it's a cliche that people have. Um, I don't necessarily have a ten year. 10 year vision. I think what I'd like to see uh, over the next three years, and I like to think of it on smaller, I'd like to see us really um, developing products so that we're not relying on um, uh, very high friction distribution channels. Um, so I want to be able to deliver um, our solution at scale whenever someone has a physical injury. And if someone has a problem, I don't want them to have to wait two months to go see a physio. If we can add value and improve people's lives before that, that would be a happy place. Now, the way our tech is now, we can't do that yet. It's still very much niched out. But as we grow, as we develop, as we build reputation, I think in, in about three years, I'd like us to be in that position. Um, that's how I look at it. I don't necessarily think about the exit or the big money sale or or anything like that to begin with. I think we just are we solving the problem? Can we get that that gap between someone actually seeing a physio and not much much down? Can we make them adhere to exercise it's better? Can they be happier? Um, live a better life. I think that's more of a priority for me rather than um thinking about making it a five billion dollar business even though that would be great and i'd be really happy i'm sure that'll come with its stresses um, there's no point doing it if you're not actually solving that core problem mm -hmm. and in terms of referencing to like the books that you read this is um and then in like nowadays obviously technology is moving so much faster than what it was back when some of these books would have been written so are you finding now that like when you when you just pick up what you said there where we'd like to do de developing things, but the technology is not there yet, but we're sort of guessing that it's going to be there in two years or a year's time or three years time. Are you sort of like having to predict where technology is going to be and then hoping that technology is there by the time you get to that point in your business? And, and how, how do you think that's changed, you know, in I, society versus 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago? I don't think it's necessarily that technology as a whole is not there. Um, I think it's more about how people perceive the tech and what their willingness to interact with the tech is, right? So um, 10 years ago, how interested would I be in understanding sleep data if it wasn't coming from a sleep doctor? Whereas now I wear my, my aura ring and I look at that daily. It's like 10 years ago, how interested would I be in taking brain care support? but I do that now because I'm educated on it. I understand the benefits. I understand what that value is. Um, and I think COVID has helped accelerate people's willingness to interact with health data because they understand it a bit more. People have been taking a more active interest in dumbing down complex messages and making it easy to understand. Um, I think... I hate to talk about it. Generative AI is doing a great thing in the sense that we can actually democratize access to quick feedback. Now, the issue with that is that it tends to be quite generic. So that's a huge risk. Uh, people typically need fine-tuned, personalized advice, um, and that will grow with time um, and with more data being created. Um, so I think it's more about 
making sure that we're not trying to spend too much money building something that no one knows they need yet. That's why we're really focused on working with physiotherapists, educating them um, to educate the patient um, because that creates a more reliable journey flow and something that people are more um, willing to uptake now. Um, and with time, uh, I think as we educate, we build profile um, and the likes of what we do, um, Aura and all these other wearables increase even Apple Watches and heart rate monitors, things like that. Um, I think over the next over the next uh, five to ten years, people are gonna really um, take control of, of that health data without needing to rely as heavily on going into a clinic. Um, although that's really important still. Yeah, I can imagine the market becoming huge as um yeah, just I was just thinking about it like you've got the woo you, 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 you also gotta think got you know, it's the matching technology up with the body, you know, with, with what's going on in your body. It's, yeah, it's huge, isn't it? Yeah, and I think the, the big challenge is, and I face it a lot of time when I'm talking with a product manager, for example, and the, and the team is like, I want to do many more things, but it's just being really mindful that trying to do more features um, without having the data to back up that development is not always the best path just because once again you want to build sustainably in the sense mm -hmm. that you want to build in line with what the patient expectations are and where they're they're up to now when we have lots of funding like the likes of the big the big guys do they can actually build two or three years ahead of of today um which makes it easier for them to take risks um, and we don't so it's just finding that balance you know um Best example is uh, the, the the glasses method just just released. You know, Google. I think it was Google that tried to release glasses um, a number of years ago, and they just looked super odd. Um, they did the exact same thing. They looked super odd, but like people just didn't know how to use it. It just didn't make sense for the consumer. Uh, but it takes time to actually figure that out. And you know, I I saw um, that that release from them last week and I was like I want one of those <laughs> so okay. um, whereas I didn't want one of those like a few years ago so it's mm -hmm. about just making sure it's done in a timely manner and, it, and even Google can get things wrong and we think how 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 do they ever make a mistake with the amount of money they've got the people they've got the brains they've got behind them it's like how do you even how do they ever get anything wrong um it, 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 that, there's so many stories of that happening, right? Um, pretty sure in, in that book I was reading, build about how they they presented the iPod. Um, the the iPhone was presented at at, at Tony's um, last company, and they just rejected it. So it's like <laughs> once again, everything's great in hindsight. Um, so yeah, awesome. Is there anything that you? I should be asking you that I've not asked you already, Chris. No, um, it's a it's a really exciting time. You know, sometimes I I seem as a founder that it's um, stressful and difficult, but I I just love love what we do because, um, you know, when you get the buy in from people in the industry, um, not exactly not necessarily like your family and friends, but you get the buy in from people in the industry who are working in it day in day out. Um, that gives you the motivation that you're solving a good problem um so that keeps me going and i i, I enjoy that bit um i guess there's so many challenges that come with it that makes it fun because one moment you're really happy because you had a great um, investor call and the next moment uh, something gets screwed up so i think just enjoying that is really important awesome all right, Chris, well, it's been so uh, great to speak to you. I think it's like been absolutely fascinating in terms of our health tech, where it's going and, and um, your business. Where can people find you? Is anywhere, um, if people are interested, what, what, what's the best way people Yeah, just um, I'm really overly active on LinkedIn. Um, I've started tweeting recently. Um, so LinkedIn, just Chris Fernandez. Twitter, I think it's Chris A. Fernandez. Or company handles is our we are body um across all platforms awesome 
Okay, Chris, thanks so much. We'll wrap it up there. Sweet.